I want to break it down a little bit more in terms of what it means for the market and your portfolio. Joining us now uh, for more on that front is James Liu, Clearnomics founder and CEO. Uh, James, good to be chatting with you again here. I mean, you just heard Emily breaking all that down. Uh, and some people are noting that the report would have been stronger if not for that cold front that really interrupted a lot of things here across the U.S. So what's uh, what stands out to you in that report and kind of the reaction we got uh, in the 10 year once again spiking to a new year high? Hey, Zach, good morning. Good to speak with you. Um, obviously, it was a really good report. It beat expectations and it was a reversal of some of the poor numbers that we had seen at the end of last year and during the early winter months. So overall, this confirms that the economy is coming back on track. And this is basically the best upside case one could have imagined just a year ago when all this began. But as far as how it affects the markets, really, there are two competing theories in the market right now. The first is that interest rates are rising because we may see runaway inflation, the economy may overheat, and the Fed may blink and start to take, take away the punch bowl. The other theory, which we subscribe to, is that interest rates are rising. But overall, that's generally a good thing. That's because the economy is bouncing back strongly. And if you take a look at history, although short-term shocks to interest rates are disruptive, as we're seeing right now, in the long run, that's actually a good thing for equity markets and for the economy. So there's a lot of disagreement in the market, it seems, which is why we're seeing these large swings. But overall, we think these reports are good for the economy and the pace of the recovery. James, this is happening against the backdrop of Washington. Uh, the Senate lawmakers de uh, debating that $1.9 trillion stimulus plan right now. When you consider how strong the numbers were that came out today, does that justify some of the concerns that we have seen in the market about overheating? Essentially, we've got an economy that is picking up, at least if you look at the labor market, in its recovery, and yet you've got $1.9 trillion that could potentially now come online as well. Yeah, that's right, Akiko. I think I think that speaks to how targeted stimulus measures can or should be, uh, because it is the case that about half of the economy has already recovered. I mean, of the 22 plus million jobs that were lost, we've regained over 13 million of that. However, it's the other half where you know you still have about 42 percent of those unemployed that have been unemployed for 27 weeks or longer. That's really what the concern is. Of course, as the vaccine gets rolled out, as the economy comes fully back online, that hopefully should resolve itself also, but that'll take time. So we do think the stimulus measures are still justified at this point. Um, we don't think that they're as inflationary as many might believe them to be, partly just because you know we still have a ways to go in terms of the economic recovery. Overall, however, that does mean that there is a cushion for those who are still suffering through this crisis, and that should, of course, help to cushion any blow to the economy overall. Yeah, and James, I mean, when we think about what it means for those inflation expectations uh, and, and kind of this position that Jay Powell's now caught in, uh, what do you make of kind of his stance there to say, look, you know, we're not going to intervene here. We're going to stay accommodated, but not necessarily maybe uh, to the way that a lot of investors would have wanted to hear from him and maybe uh, going forward with some of these new proposals. When we hear what happened, uh, we'll hear what happens in a couple of weeks once we get that new policy update. But what do you make of kind of the position he's now caught in and how it relates to what we saw years ago at the Tabor tantrum? Well, Jay Powell is obviously in a tough position. He needs to thread the needle in terms of language, just like his last two predecessors had to. But I, I do think it's kind of funny, though, and ironic in that essentially every time the the Fed is about to reverse policy, you know, of course, markets and investors are highly, highly focused on that initial step. But as we saw over basically the last decade, once that initial step is taken, whether it's to reduce accommodation on the balance sheet in terms of in terms of asset purchases or to actually begin increasing interest rates, essentially the market is able to take that in stride once it's able to factor that in. So it's really about communication and it's about the timing of this. Clearly the long end of the curve uh, moving as much as it has, that has been a shock at, at, in terms of how quickly that's happened. But we are still firmly the belief that the Fed has learned from the last two cycles, including the taper tantrum. And it's unlikely the Fed will blink in this scenario, especially as the economy is still recovering. So James, let's talk about where uh, investors should be putting their money. Right now, we're looking at uh, some of the sectors that are performing uh, the strongest today. Energy, no surprise here, up about 2%, although that's largely on uh, the OPEC decision that came out. Uh, I wonder where you see the money flowing to right now. If there's so many who are saying, you know, it's no longer, they're no longer keeping their money in bonds, uh, does it immediately jump to specific equities or are we seeing uh, 
money flow in, in other uh, assets? So there certainly is a rotation trade happening right now. So within equities, we tend to believe um, that the rotation into essentially the reopening trade, uh, the sectors that were hard hit and can start to outperform uh, the rest of this year, that will continue. That's what we've seen so far this year. There is still an open question about whether that's the case, depending on the pace of vaccinations and reopening. But we think that that's probably where the more interesting trade lies on the equity side. Uh, in terms of fixed income, you know, we basically have these twin challenges. Interest rates, of course, are very low, but that's been the case for you know 12 years at the very least. And in fact, interest rates have been declining for 40 years. And at the same time, the bigger challenge today uh, in the face of that is that interest rate volatility has increased, meaning duration risk is much more pronounced today than it has been in the past. So uh, essentially, on the fixed income side, investors not only need to find greater yield, uh, potentially that means moving into you know taking on a little bit more risk, uh, whether that's moving from investment grade to high yield or from high yield into private credit, et cetera, or it means reducing duration on the other end of the spectrum where you can generate some yield, but you take on slightly less total return risk when interest rates move. So, you know, bond investors are still in a very tricky position here. We still believe in a standard, you know, 60-40 portfolio. Maybe there are some adjustments to be made in those percentages. But overall, we think that that portfolio and essentially staying the course in terms of holding onto a balanced portfolio still makes sense in this environment. Yeah, interestingly, I mean, when we talk about tech, yeah, it was hit in a lot of these kind of reactions to yields rising, but uh, today only off by about a tenth of a percent. Consumer discretionary uh, off by a wider margin, the biggest loser today off one and a half percent. And I guess kind of the concerns there, uh, we know what tech would suffer there if we see interest rates rise, but a lot of people say we're a couple years uh, away from that happening. So when you look at maybe the consumer discretionary piece of this right now, people are pointing to energy prices, perhaps rising uh, prices at the pump to maybe impact how we're going to be spending here. When you look at the underlying health of the consumer, we've been talking a lot about savings rates uh, moving higher here in the pandemic. So talk to me about the strength there uh, and what could happen in the short term if you think about uh, you know this reopening trade and where they're going to be spending their money. Well, that's right, Zach. Uh, in terms of sectors, you, the immediate impact of the shocks we've seen in markets uh, clearly trickle through to sectors directly. So energy is a good example of that with energy prices and oil prices rising. Uh, you also have financials with a steepening yield curve, uh, potentially poised to benefit from that. Uh, but once all the dust settles, really, it's what you mentioned. The consumer is in a strong position. Now, maybe they don't spend twice as much as they would have in normal times, but there is some degree of pent-up demand. Uh, you saw significant bounce backs in retail spending, even with uh, elevated levels of savings alongside that, which means that, you know, essentially consumers are saving up some ammunition for, you know, spending down the road. And overall, um, we think that the fact that there are many sectors who have underperformed uh, over the last year due to the crisis, they could be poised to do a bit better here. Uh, you also mentioned tech and tech, you know, it's important to distinguish between sort of the short-term impacts of interest rates versus the long-term secular trends in tech, which are really the key reason why tech is exciting, not because you know, they did well when everyone was stuck at home necessarily. So overall, there are still several of these key thematic ideas in tech, financials, and consumer sectors that we think are very attractive over the next 12 to 24 months. All right, James Liu, Clearnomics founder and CEO. Appreciate uh, you joining us for your take on that. Uh, have a great weekend.